actually sound like a bird. That does not sound like it did in the film. But maybe you grasped. Oh, also welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Davis. I'm Benjamin Holden. Maybe you grasped from that little beginning who we're doing a podcast with today. But very who, special guest. Very, very special guest. So today we have on the podcast Ethan Supley and he is an American film and TV actor. He's best known for his roles in the films American History X, Remember the Titans, The Wolf of Wall Street, so hopefully you can gauge why we're doing that. And my name is Earl and he is incredible yeah he's, it's just he's, incredible. Um, he's been through a transformation over his life and we just wanted to get him onto the podcast today to really give you more detail about his transformation and also just in how much of a sustainable and healthy way he did it from his peak of his weight gain he got up to 550 pounds or there or thereabout and then got all the way down to 220 pounds so we just wanted to have ethan on today to give you some insight into how you can lose weight and how it can be done and also how it can be sustained. So without any further ado, we're going to go into the podcast and enjoy. So thank you so much for coming on our podcast today, Ethan. It honestly means so much to us because your story is honestly, it's so inspirational. And because me and Ben are very heavy in the fitness space, it it was it's just made a lot of sense for us for you to share your story with our followers as well as well in the UK. I think, I think the biggest thing is is because of how transparent you've been so far of your story and talking to other people about it. And I think the main thing that people will take away from today's podcast will be the fact we know one of the biggest issues is when it comes to weight loss and with transformations is the sustainability afterwards. Like most people know how to, to lose weight and can lose weight. But then the biggest problem that we have as an industry is, is then losing it. So I think one thing that people will take away today is an insight into how it's possible and how you can come from from A to B and still manage to sustain that part of it as hard as that may be. So I think what I want to do, Ethan, if that's okay, is just kind of dive into first before we go through the weight loss journey of how the other side of it came about, i.e. the the weight gain, if you don't mind taking us back to the very start with that bit, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me, by the way. It's nice to talk to you guys. Um, The first diet I was ever put on by um, kind of the people in charge, I was five years old. And uh, honestly, it becomes very, it, it becomes a tricky point, which I don't even really have solutions for today. I mean, I have ideals, but I don't know that they're, um, hard and fast solutions to offer people, but it, it, it had the opposite effect of what was intended. And, um, you know, I went from having kind of no idea about my body. Like I I wasn't self-aware at all to having this sense of wrongness with myself that I didn't even really understand. I just knew that um, oh, oh yeah, this body, I have this body, which I wasn't, I had never even thought about it in those terms before. And, and then suddenly the idea was there's something wrong with it. It's bad. And it's, and I'm going to get punished because my body is bad. And that kind of, um, you know, and I can't say that I wouldn't have gone this direction anyway. I have no idea, but, uh, but I did just continue to gain weight because I, I got very good at lying and, and sneaking food and eating privately from a very young age. Um, and, and really, um, the minute I was told I had to exercise, uh, not because I was a kid and I enjoyed being outside and, and being active, which I, I had prior to this, but because there was again, something wrong with me and this was now a punishment, I stopped having any interest in doing it. And, and the minute I was told that um, my food was gonna be restricted, not because you know, we discussed it and I got on board with some idea of having a healthy body or, or having some kind of even a, a vain aesthetic goal, which I'm more than happy to have today. Um, that I could participate in with my own determination. It was, there's, there's this wrongness about me and, 
as a punishment, I'm going to be put on these various and sometimes like truly crazy. Like we ventured into like um, nothing that you could say was like abusive, but like absolutely batched at crazy nutritionists who yeah. were doing things that like, and, and, and I today try to be very open with like anything that works for anybody is valid, I think. And if you have a winning formula, I'm not going to discount it. But even with that perspective, some of the stuff that was kind of foisted upon me as a kid was batshit nuts. Sorry, am I allowed to say shit? Yeah, You're allowed yeah, to yeah, swear. Yeah. We do it quite a lot. <laughs> I might have to say shite for you guys to, shite, really yes. to, to feel comfortable. But, if there's, but any, like, there's any point where we're talking and you don't quite understand our accent as well, please just feel free to sl- tell us to slow down. I'm so glad we're doing a video Zoom because I'm watching your guys' lips as you talk just in case <laughs> I miss anything. And feel, you know, the same for me. I'm sure my accent's nuts too. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think what we're going to do as well for people who are watching on YouTube, we'll probably flash the two images up. They're really symbolic images of, of your transformation as well, Ethan, because I think at your heaviest point, were you like 550? Yeah, I, the, the, the heaviest I ever actually saw myself on a scale was 536 and it was on a a, a freight scale like a shipping scale because they that at that time you know this is also i don't know what it's like over there but here there's plenty of obesity now but Mm -hmm. you know um 30 years ago here it was kind of rare so there were no scales at doctor's offices that Mm -hmm. went that high i don't even know if that exists today in doctor's offices but they kind of went to 350 and then i remember they jumped up when i was a teenager to like 400 and even then i couldn't weigh myself on these scales so there was uh one point i went into a a treatment center for 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 drug abuse and um and in order to during intake they had they they had to weigh me and and we had to find a shipping center that weighed like big crates and boxes and and i was 536 and uh you know also, I was the only guy who was addicted to drugs who continued to gain weight. Like I didn't even get that as a benefit, unfortunately, which I always had in my mind, like, well, I'm going to do a bunch of drugs and dr- drug addicts are thin. It never happened for me. Mm. And then I continued to gain weight for a little while after rehab. Um, so I know that, yes, I mean, I'm sorry for all the qualifications. I say 550 because, you know, uh, a 14 pound swing when you're that heavy is yeah. like nothing, you know, mm. it's a little extra salt yeah, it's one like day. Taking shit the next day. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, but I, I saw 536. I say 550 because it, it seems realistic to me. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll pop those um, two different images on screen anyway, so people can see because it's, it's not, it's not just like a, a weight loss transformation, like on the end image of where I'm guessing like you had a photo shoot, like you, you look saucy as well. Like you'll, you've, you've, You've gone past that point of like just losing weight and obviously you've started to add lean body mass, you start to build a bit of physique and, and you've really took it like that extra mile after you've you completed that journey. But I'm glad you touched upon the whole obesity part as well and how like I suppose I've never really come across like any scales which would weigh that heavy. So I guess like we're not set up to, to deal with that kind of like scale of obesity. But I think that's only becoming more and more apparent as we move through like the obesity since like 1975 has tripled. If we look at like the US and the UK, they're probably like the two top countries in regards mm-hmm. to the world, in regards to obesity rate. Like I've got some stats here, like the UK obesity rate is 27.8%. The US is 36.2%. And then you look at someone like Japan, who has an obesity rate of 3.2%. <laughs> it's kind of like- and, and honestly, By the way, those highlights. are also sumo wrestlers who are like gods over there. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. literally. So you go to show like the lifestyle base of how, how, how much we can pin like obesity on and how crazy it's getting and the, the financial strain that it's having for, for us in the NHS is, is massive and it's billions of pounds every year. And I know for the US, it's like 190 billion, I think it was, which is like 21% of the medical spending. So it's crazy like how much money it's, it's taken up and how it's predicted to only get worse, I suppose, with scale as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And sorry, just on those, I had a question to ask. When you were at your heaviest, so say the five fifty pounds, I I guess like how did that affect 
you as a person like physically and mentally like your everyday life um I know I've listened to one of your podcasts for it was brilliant it was actually on YouTube and you're explaining about the nervousness about just sitting on a chair which was like an obviously an everyday thing so yeah just a little bit about that yeah it's it's a very odd thing to think about now because none of that was um shocking or off-putting even because it happened over so much time and Mm. it it was it was so gradual that it you know it took me breaking a chair at 10 years old to start to realize like oh I can't just jump down on a chair as hard as I want I, I need to ease into it right and so that just kind of grew you know and then when I think about how much pain I was in almost constantly, um, just sitting still became hard because of the pressure on, on my back in certain positions and on my joints, I'd have to move to alleviate that. There's a ton of stuff that was not thought about at all, like pain in my feet, pain in my lower back, pain in my hips, not being able to lay flat when I went to sleep because I couldn't breathe. Um, the 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 embarrassment of somebody hearing me breathe like on an elevator so I would always hold my breath if I was near people or not wanting people to wit- witness me get totally winded at walking up a couple of stairs so I got very good at actually holding my breath a lot and then very slowly recovering and keeping um you know wearing multiple shirts because I would sweat through one and I didn't like visible sweat stains. So, uh, you know, I'd also carry washcloths in my pocket so I could quickly and, um, you know, kind of undercover wipe my brow so nobody saw that if I just let it go, I would be dripping sweat almost constantly. Yeah. The, these things were not something I just woke up to one day. So they were just part of my life. So it's been very interesting to kind of think back to the way I lived before at that way and think about how different it is today and still catch myself in some of the behaviors um, that I might not need to uh, uh, be participating in, like checking every chair, which I still do. Um, and, I, and I'm probably at a weight now, I'm still on the bigger side. I'm still a very, very large, heavy guy. Um, but but uh, chairs are probably generally built to withstand my weight now, you know? I still check them because it's something that I did for 20 years for real because I was potentially going to break them. Yeah. So it's like psychological. Like, yeah. Well, like a yeah. habit, isn't it as well? Yeah. It's like, it's something you've done for so many years. Automatically, you're still just, just checking. So it is like a, a well, habit. I, I was pulling some things up and like things that weigh 500 pounds is like a panda bear or like a grizzly bear. So checking chairs because you're that way isn't is no surprise that you'd want to do that and be be conscious of something like that as well um yeah but when you were going through that process as well even i suppose even even up until now were you kind of taking any health markers or uh-huh. as you went along like were you getting any bloods done or blood pressure to kind of like check where you're up to like throughout the the process of the transformation of the journey yeah and uh i had to get uh frequent um physicals for for work because you're always insured um as an actor you go to do a movie and it's like if something happens to you the movie could be potentially out a lot of money yeah. um and I, I know that for for a lot of years there were there was uh basically movies were paying extra insurance just to have me on them because i was a higher risk i um I felt some embarrassment by that, but there was never, uh, there was, I I just didn't spend a lot of time concerned with my health. Health was truly the kind of last thing that was a motivator for me. Yeah, massively. And that's actually so interesting what you said there about when you're on these movie set, I don't know if you even call it a movie set. Have I just made it on a movie (laughs) set? Um, That, there were extra health precautions uh for yourself it's obviously it's just quite interesting isn't it like i don't know much about 
the movie space and things like that so it is actually really interesting to kind of understand a little bit about how they deal with different actors and things as well i think the thing that i always find interesting when we look at the obese population and i know it's always a big topic and especially at the moment on social media is like the whole weight stigma and fat shamer and that kind of thing Mm -hmm. did you experience much of that in in the whole acting industry no, no, not so much in the act. No, not in the acting industry. It was always kind of uh, strangely a benefit to me because um, it made me stand out. It made me interesting. It was yeah. something that was not typical, which I think uh, movies like from time to time. Mm-hmm. So, no, as far as acting goes, I, I never experienced that. So do you feel like that? gave you if anything then like more opportunities or different opportunities and do you kind of feel like sometimes you were maybe pigeonholed into certain certain roles because of your size yeah i mean for sure yeah. it, it it definitely gave it within my within the group of guys that i would be considered for parts with it was a much smaller group than yeah. just say you know if you think about our union has hundreds of thousands of people in it. There was just a very few of us. So in that sense, it was very easy or, or it was a benefit. Yeah. Um, and, and, but as, yes, pigeonholed for sure. I mean, there were certainly some roles that I got that were not necessarily written for uh, bigger guys. And I went in and they were like, Oh, this is interesting. Let's hire him. Um, uh so it wasn't absolute in those terms, but, but you know, it definitely played a part. Yeah. I suppose like on the other um, side of the scale, and do you feel like, because now you've made that transition and now you look the way that you do, like you look like a house, like you look great at the moment. Um, do you think that's opened up different opportunities for you and it will do in the future in regards to your acting career? I think that that the pool of guys, you know, I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. I just did a movie where I played a military veteran and I, I certainly wouldn't have been able to do that um, or, or probably wouldn't have been considered for that had I been still as overweight as I, mm-hmm. as I was. Um, so y- yes and no. I think yeah. that the, uh, the pool of guys, I, I actually have no idea because I, I don't have uh, such a great sense of myself. I, I, I don't, know if I see myself the way anybody else does so I I couldn't say that I that that the the pool of guys who look like me now is much larger than the pool of guys who are overweight although I know that the pool of guys that are overweight is also growing exponentially right as the country becomes more and more obese so does that group there's a, a larger group of actors now who can take that role so I'm glad that I'm not competing with them um I, I i just i don't i, yeah. I don't know these think, are not things i think about that yeah, much yeah 100 i think the first time I saw, I saw you on screen was i think was um my name is l yeah um, do you remember that one yes i think i might was that might have been a tad young i i remember you from wolf of wall street <laughs> <laughs> it's good what do you remember like what weight you were kind of at around then yeah um I started the first season of my name is Earl. i was around 300 pounds and by the time we finished, I was around 400 pounds. Yeah. So a big, big transition. Do you, yeah. do you know, like when you're watching some of the episodes and stuff back then, or some of the roles that you've played, because obviously it's very different from looking in the mirror to then watching a, a, a movie back or a, a screen back, because you just can see yourself at a lot of different angles. Do you remember like looking or watching anything back and thinking, Jesus Christ, like I've never saw that before, or it gave you like a different realization? Well, because of that, for that very point, um, th- the the first acting job I ever had was a television series over here called Boy Meets World. This was probably even before you two were alive. <laughs> um, uh, early, early 90s. So maybe you were little kids or babies or something. But uh, the, the, the first episode that I watched on TV, I was so surprised with seeing myself from angles I had never seen before that I utterly gave up and I have never watched anything I've done because of that, because I didn't understand how anybody could stand looking at me 
um, I could barely get beyond looking at myself in a mirror. So then to see myself from a, another bizarre angle that made me even look bigger, you know, from the back and the side a little bit where it just caught the entire girth of me mm -hmm. was so jarring that I, I've never watched anything I've done uh, because I just um, become too self-aware mm -hmm. and am constantly thinking like, well, no, you can't put the camera over there. I must look awful over there. And I, I don't want to do that. It's too much to think about. Yeah. yeah, That's actually really interesting. So you've not watched any of the movies or TV shows since, like ever? No. Oh. I think I get that though, because it's like if, if you see a photo of yourself on like Instagram or something, you're like, fuck me, I look like shit there. You, you just took it away, don't you? You don't yeah. want to see it again? Yeah, to be fair, actually, I've never ever watched one of my own YouTube videos. Yeah. I just record them and put them up. I I just, yeah, I get to, yeah, that makes sense. I have caught my kids before watching My Name is Earl, and I was very perplexed at mm. why they would want to do that and just left the room quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, obviously, that, that transition that you made, I, I'm sure I, I heard you mention it. I don't know if I saw you on his um, social media before, is, is uh, Mike Isatel as well um because we've followed his work for like a long long yeah, time he's great. and i think obviously the, the the great thing for you is that you ran into like i suppose the right people at the right time as well um yeah that makes I, such I, an impact and a difference i there i there's no way the, the, that is and going back to something you said in the beginning the idea of sustainability for almost 20 years i from the moment that i th had the first uh, inclination desire to start losing weight and it wasn't something that was being imposed upon me but it was a my own goal um there there was no idea in any of these diets um of what to do for the rest of my life mm -hmm. you know there was a point where I guess I thought, you know, I'm not allowed to eat carbohydrates for the rest of my life. This is, this is my burden to carry. I'm allergic to them. They don't react well with me. And so I just will never eat carbohydrates again or eat them like four times a year or something like mm -hmm. this and expect massive weight gain, you know, on Christmas day, mm -hmm. I'll gain 20 pounds and that'll be worth it. And then I'll work for a while to get it off. Um, all of that kind of extreme stuff did not last. There was no lasting thing. And it was really through Mike's work. And and I got to give some credit to like um, Lane Norton also. Yeah, as well as an engine. Yeah. Great. Um, ama amazing guys. But <clears throat> And it wasn't even that I read something that made me go like, oh, I now know what to do. It was just on their programs where they would insist on maintenance periods um, in between fat loss phases that I, I realized like it hit me like a fucking ton of bricks one day. Mm. This is how you live. Yeah. Holy shit. This maintenance, like I never thought of it. It just occurred to me. And it was after having done it for a while, like this is what a fucking normal person does this yeah. whole thing. I'm still on the plan. I could not believe it. And that has been the most life changing thing because I, after doing it for a long, like I can do any diet. You want to give me 350 calories a day and tell me I'm going to do this for 30 or 60 days. I'll do it. I will crush those 60 days. I'll feel awful. I'll be lightheaded. I'll be, my vision will be disappearing when I stand up. I'll be cold the whole time. Like, but I'll get through it on day 61. That's it. I'm now gaining weight. You know what I mean? So this whole idea of, by the way, I kind of love what bodybuilders do because it's just a very, very simple, rational, healthy yo-yo diet. It's very simple. And then instead of doing bulking, I do maintenance mm -hmm. and I'm able to build a little bit of muscle, maybe not as much as I could if I put on 30 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm able to build muscle in that area too, which has been magical because I can like, that's what I've done for so long with no, with no science or no thought to it. I just kill myself dieting and then 
try to hold off weight as long as I can, but it's coming back. I know it's coming back. It comes back and then I got to kill myself dieting again. And the diets that I've been on, when I follow programs like Mike's, Mike Isertel's and, and Lane's, they're not hard. They're the easiest diets. Like I, I, um, my, my coach right now is a guy named Jared Feather. He's one of Mike's students. Mm -hmm. um, he's a professional bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah. And the, the picture you're talking about, he coached me to that picture. Um, and towards the last week, um, he got concerned about my hunger and he was like, are you okay? Cause we're really, this is the lowest calories we've had you on in a year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is nothing. This isn't hard. I'm not even hungry. Yeah. Like this is not, this doesn't seem like a diet. We're cheating. Yeah. You know, um, it's all so much easier. Uh, I think it takes quite a bit of installing of new habits because yeah. to to go from extremes and to go from total chaos and not knowing what you're doing there's a lot of reshaping that that it requires but once you once you get there and you realize how much effort and how much stress um and how hard most of the other diets were this doesn't even feel like dieting to me it's mm -hmm. really bizarre i think that's it whereas like especially for us as health health and fitness professionals we and the industry let people down is that people it, it, again depends on like which people and which educators you come across first because we spend a lot of our time now trying to reverse the system that people got into where they think it always has to be like fucking balls to the wall i've got to crush it I've got to be on minimal calories i've got to be like cardio every day and you get this wrong perception of what it what it actually is and breaking down those psychological barriers of, of being like right okay now we need to take a diet break now we need to get you back to, to maintenance calories for a little bit to make this more sustainable. It is quite often and quite a hard psychological battle to get over with people. But I feel like if often the thing that's quite hard for people, and we've discussed this in a previous podcast, is the term maintenance for some people just like it's not sexy. It doesn't like symbolize progress. So it's, it's, it's difficult for people to get them, them, the, their head around a lot of time. But when they do, it makes that process so much more um sustainable as well and there's a there's a study that was just been literally released like two weeks ago which you might be interested in if you've been looking around diet breaks or you might have already seen it if you're working with those guys as well called the ice cap study and that's on diet breaks as well and just how that helps like um suppress hunger levels suppress appetite makes the weight loss more sustainable it's great for hormone balance and metabolic rate like it just there's so many things to be taken away from it and if sometimes you just take that step back and can really consider what you're doing because again like we said at the start of the podcast so so many people lose weight the problem that we have is wh why aren't people sustaining it well yeah it's this it's the sustainability and when you initially started your your weight loss journey i guess what's there for you i don't know some people have like a massive turning point in their life or there's there's something that happens and it's like a flick of the switch did you ever have that or did you just suddenly think for yourself you've got to do it was there like a trigger uh there, there was a moment where um i'm married now i have four kids they're old they're probably some of them are your age and mm. and there was a moment where i was looking at my life before i was married but i was seeing this girl and i was thinking like um if i want to have a, a, a long-term relationship with this woman she was a girl we were both kids back then but but there's not gonna be a future if i don't make a change so there was that moment yeah. and then that followed 15 to 20 years of yo-yo dieting um i would i would diet really hard or i would start some you know insane exercise program um, and, and there was a period for two years where I just rode a bike. I, I, right after my name is Earl, I was 400 pounds. Um, and I kind of was like, I don't really feel like working right now. I need to lose weight. What am I going to do? I started riding a bike. I got super into that to the point where for two years, 40 hours a week, I was just riding a bike to lose wow. weight. And, and 
you know, and then I crashed my bike. I wound up in the hospital. I couldn't ride my bike. I gained a bunch of weight and it was just this yeah. like, you know, so it was a constant battle. And I, at one point was totally resigned to like, I was even thinking I'm going to map it out and I'm going to have like, you know, January through May will be my diet months. And then it'll be really strict dieting. I'll do super hardcore diets, maybe even liquid diets. And then, you know, uh, for the rest of the year, I'll try to, I'll try to make it slow, but it'll be way back. And I, I just was utterly resigned to the idea that I'm going to be yo-yo dieting forever because mm-hmm. from what I saw is no matter how hard I worked to take it off, um, if I wasn't on a diet, I was gaining weight, period, full stop. And so the, the turning point for me was being super determined to lose weight again. This was like maybe 2016. And I spent a year and I was looking at all this stuff, uh, reading about keto and I, and it kind of was like, seemed like, well, that's all I'm getting, I'm eating mostly meat. So that's gotta be a lot of protein. So maybe that'll be good for muscles. And I wanted to have, because I, I, at one point also got to be so skinny that I didn't like it. You know, when I was yeah. 200, I'm, I'm 260 today. When I was 200 pounds, I, I felt uncomfortably, mm-hmm. I felt frail. Yeah. Um, I also uh, got to 200 pounds and still wasn't nearly as lean as I am now, which was really weird. Um, so 2016, I decide like, I'm going to just do keto and lift weights. And uh, I was losing weight, but when I, I wanted to like gauge it because I felt like I was just... Um, getting smaller kind of uniformly none of my muscles were sticking out I was just now smaller which Mm -hmm. is to be expected to some degree but I started having DEXA scans every three months and what I realized was doing keto first of all if I wanted to lose weight doing keto I had to restrict food I didn't think about it in terms of restricting calories. I just knew that if I ate whatever I wanted, I would not lose weight, even if it was just steaks and avocados, right? And lots of olive oil. I wasn't losing weight. So I would then go like, okay, I'm just going to eat smaller portions. And then I would lose weight. And as long as I stuck to that, for every 10 pounds of weight loss, four of it was lean tissue. And, I, and, and that didn't really make sense to me, yeah. but I kept doing it for a, for a while. And I was like, there's got to be a way to like mitigate some of that lean tissue. And that was when I discovered Mike Isratel. And, and that was when I kind of went like, okay, maybe I'm not allergic to carbohydrates and maybe I need more protein even than I'm getting on keto. Um, and I kind of gave that a shot and it, the, the difference was so night and day. Um, it was shocking how fast my body looked different, which was what I wanted. You know, it wasn't just, I, the number on the scale is great, but that wasn't necessarily the factor I wanted. I wanted to see my trap stick out. I wanted to see a line in my bicep. What I ultimately wanted was visible abdominals. And I wasn't getting anywhere near that because as I lost weight, I was also losing muscle and I didn't understand this because I was weightlifting every day, but I also had never looked at a progressive overload. So I was just in the gym going like today's chest. I'm going to go to failure every day, you know, or three times a week or something like that, or just doing like kind of mindless weightlifting. I can't lift it anymore. I'm done. I'm going to go do something else. Um, And when I started like applying I also had an injury. I tore my bicep. Like I wasn't smart. I, everything I'm doing now, I'm, I'm, I feel like an old man and I can't be as extreme. I want to have a exercise I can do every day for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I can for sure do progressive overload for the rest of my life. Like there's no, it's really become very easy. Yeah, I've got a guy at the moment who I work with who's like 65 and he's like an absolute beast and he's yeah. like progressively overloading his training and it's just because he's looked after himself of what he's doing and he knows like what maximum recovery volume is, he knows when to pull back, he knows when to take rest days, he knows like what, when he's kind of like losing performance and that's when we need to take a bit of a deload from training. I think that's the, the good thing and obviously when you've been with Mike is that I think when the focus a lot of the time becomes about 
building lean body mass and that's uh, a focus and a target organically a lot of people tend to just drop body fat anyway as long as they obviously diet and having that different focus apart from just like being drilled into your head like i must lose weight for a lot of people is almost like a psychological break and they could just have that target of focusing on training and focusing on building lean tissue which is obviously a, a benefit for a lot of people i think the thing that i was i was going to lead on to next because i know you briefly just touched on it because I mean, momentum's a big thing, especially when we're looking at weight loss and we're looking at, uh, through a journey. However, there's sometimes like a fine line between, I know I've been there and you've been there, mm. with when things become like excessive and you start crossing that boundary of like, I need to, I, although you don't know it, you know you need to, you should pull back, but you can't stop it because you've got that momentum there and you feel like taking a day off is like, it's going to throw things off. Did you ever find that you got to that point where, you were doing so much exercise or you were doing so much that it did become excessive and you kind of crossed that boundary of like being on the other side of healthy? Yes, for sure. I've done everything excessively. I've done dieting excessively. I've done eating excessively. I've done uh, exercise excessively. And I've done sitting around and doing nothing excessively. I have done everything excessively. Um, I, if I was to result, resort to my most base instincts, all I would do is eat fast food until I was sick and watch TV. That's it. I wouldn't do or play video games or, you know, watch movies. That is it. I wouldn't move and I wouldn't um, eat in an appropriate way for my body. As, I wouldn't treat food as fuel. And then when I, when I wake up and I go... I can't do this anymore. I need to go excessively in the other direction. The, the feeling of uh, anxiety to get the weight off as fast as possible and to punish myself and, and it is so severe. So I, I understand, you know, you, you're I'm mindlessly going through my life, gaining weight, not thinking about anything. And then I wake up one day and it's as though I've ne- I'm looking at myself from a different point of view or a different perspective and i'm like holy shit what's happening i need this i got it like i want to take my body off like it's clothes Mm -hmm. and change into a new set of clothes and it's like none of that is thinking long term so what i have to do now and it took a couple of years of practice is go this takes a long time. And I tell myself over and over and over again that I want to have this long term. So I'm going to set goals now for years and I'm going to set smaller goals for like this fat loss phase. How much do I want to lose? Okay. I want to lose roughly 1% of my body weight per week in fat. So if I'm going to diet for 12 weeks, how much is that for real? Like how much weight is that? Um, I'm going to be really realistic about all of this. If I want to be able to exercise every day for the rest of my life, an important thing, especially when talking about momentum, is not injuring myself. Yeah. If, I, if I go 100% every day, eventually I'm going to break, period. That's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't think anybody can go 100% every day without eventually breaking. Or you start to, you're, you're 100% on day 10, is like 50% of what it was on day one. And it's like how you're not making progress. Um, So with the idea of really stretching it out, I'm able to confront the fact that maintenance periods are training for, if I ever want to stop doing this, if I ever want to, you know, I've gone on vacation a number of times with my family over this and it's just, okay, now I'm on maintenance. Yeah. Now I'm yeah. front loading my meal with protein, lean protein. Um, I know what a cup of rice looks like because I've measured out a cup of rice 10,000 times at this point. So like I can, I can gauge it. And if the, if the restaurant gives me two cups, I'm cutting it in half and I'm only eating one of them. You know what I mean? I'm getting steamed vegetables. I'm not covering everything in oil. I'm not eating cheeseburgers. But if I feel like a cheeseburger, that's okay too. Like everything has become about moderation. And I still, having done this for like four or five years now and feeling super relaxed and super confident that I can do this, I still have to talk my through. You know, listen, to be honest with you, 
I fucking hate deload weeks. I'm doing a deload right now. It's my worst week, but it's one week every six weeks. Yeah. It's not the end of the world. And I know next week I'm going to crush it in the gym and feel like a superhero because I took this week off. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it is what it is. I'm so glad you said that though in regards to the maintenance because that's something that we tried to drill home like so often. It's such a barrier for people. And I feel like coming from a, a person in your position and, and been there, done it, it'll have such an impact on other people to kind of like reassess what they're really doing because everyone's just looking for like, how quick can I do it? How hard can I do it? How, how, how can I get down this? And there's no, there's no balance at all with that. And yeah, through certain periods, like you're going to have times where you'll chop back and you'll come back up. And it's like for a lot of people, when they save for a house, there's going to be certain like sacrifices you have to make to get to that certain point. And it's the same with your diet, but you're not saving forever. There's going to be those periods where like you can be at maintenance and you can bring the calories up and you're not going to put body fat on. I think that's when people start to realize that a little bit more. It's when we will really start to break through in regards to the fitness industry to help people sustain that weight loss over a longer period of time and it also actually really sounds like you're enjoying the process now when you first spoke about it at the start you were like I felt like I was forced to exercise and forced to eat these foods whereas you sound like listening to this podcast you've had such a big mindset change and even though those psychological food thoughts sometimes come back or thinking about this and that like myself and Ben are the same like we've both had a history of eating disorders and sometimes now four years on some sometimes the thought process goes over my head not that I'd act on it but you really honestly sound like you've you're in such a better mental state in terms of like you're actually fucking enjoying it which is such a massive part to actually create that sustainability for you yeah it's I, I can utterly sympathize with everybody who who wants to have quick results. I want to have quick, who doesn't want to have quick results? Mm. Um, I have a wife and four daughters. So I also know sometimes somebody starts some program and I'm like, what the hell? What is this crazy yeah. thing you're doing? <laughs> that maybe I did when you were two years old, but you yeah. can't remember it. Why are we doing that? And it's like, no, I just want to fit into these jeans for this barbecue on Sunday, and then I don't care. And it's like, okay, do your crazy thing for Sunday. Fine, I'm not gonna get down on you, whatever. I, I think the magical place to catch a person is when they're in desperate need of change and, and they're willing to just turn themselves over to you and go, I'll do whatever you tell me mm -hmm. to do. And then it's like, okay, let's have this conversation about you want me to crush you for a month or two and put you through hell for one day and you'll have that one day and it'll be a magical day, but then it, you're gonna, you're, it's all going to come back and I guarantee you it's all going to come back. Or do you want to totally turn your life around? And for the people who really can look at that and go, I want to totally turn my life around, then it's a conversation about like, this is going to take a long time. And maintenance is not, is not an interruption of weight loss. Mm -hmm. It's training for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That's what I think of it as. It, it literally is creating a new habit. I spent 30 plus years or, you know, uh, almost 40 years um, creating bad habits. I'm not going to undo all of yeah. those in a month or two. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort, but it can be done. And, and it's going to actually be easier than you think. Yeah, 100%. I think what, what gets a lot of people with that is, especially when it comes to the quicker weight loss. And it's such a, a killer for most people. And it's a killer for most people's joy as well is comparison. And yeah. psychologically, as humans, we all compare ourselves to other people. It's just like, it's human nature. But I think when we compare ourselves to other people's results and everyone's like so different with what they're doing, but we still compare. And that's what gets a lot of people down with, especially the fitness journeys. And from a coaching perspective, I think the difficulty we have is as well, there's still a lot of coaches in the industry and there still will be for a long time who will push people down that quick, fast weight loss group because it looks better for them i don't know what uh, for you even whether you've maybe worked with other coaches in the industry because i'm sure for coaches who have maybe worked with you before it would look great on them to get quick results like i've got ethan big hollywood actor like i'm turning around quickly we'll just 
punish you for like however many weeks and trying to get down as quick as possible because from a coaching perspective it's what sells it's not even just a coaching perspective is it when people you see people doing it it's like a business thing they do as well it's like (laughs) we've seen it so many times where they see people as like a like a sale number and like look at this amazing transformation in two weeks and it's like why do you want to even even promote that are you still helping them after those after those two weeks are up mm-hmm. yeah 100 percent. yeah have you been down that route before with trainers i'm guessing yes i i have I, you know um i have worked with a few a few different trainers i will say for the for the past four or five years i did work out mostly i still work out entirely by myself um Jared Feather, who is a, a, a rocket science scientist when it comes to this stuff, has been able to give me um, changes to really maximize efficiency, which I could not have done on my own. But I was making great progress. So th- prior to him, every kind of guy I worked out with It was really just like, here's my program and everybody does my program. We're not looking at like you and what you need as opposed to like what this other guy needs. And I have really just found that I don't think there is one size fits all to any of this. I, I, you know, some people ask me how many calories I eat a day and I'm like, I'm going to, I'll tell you that number but it really doesn't matter for you yeah. how many calories I eat. Like it, that should, that should mean absolutely nothing mm-hmm. to you. Um, I, please don't base what you do off that. You know, um, I, it, you know, if I'm doing sets of, of, you know, incline bench with 245 pounds, that doesn't mean you should do that. I don't yeah, know what the sure. hell you're doing. You know what I mean? Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I don't even think that's heavy. Like that for me is pretty light, yeah. but I can do it four time, four sets of 15 reps or, or whatever. You know what I mean? That's the reason that it's that number. What can you do, you know, to build up and, and eventually in week five be going to failure and stuff like that. Like it, it, so the, the, the guys that, um, that I've seen who are just like, everybody does this, everybody eats this way, everybody works this way we're not really thinking about um what you did yesterday at all that doesn't matter today we're doing this even if you did all these exercises yeah it it just became like i think it's very easy to create a formula or a structure and sell it as a this is good for everyone it's much much harder i think with what you guys are doing and 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 guys like mike which is like everybody's different Mm -hmm. there are some principles that we can all use in a similar way but like when it comes right down to it every single person is different how much do you sleep how much water do you drink how much how many steps are you taking it like all of these things are going to factor into it at some point and not everybody is exactly the same yeah that's 100 percent. i think a lot of people are trying to push you to to fit their mold rather than the other way around and we, like we work on like a slightly different basis so we run a, a coaching platform like on a membership basis so we've got um we don't do as much any one-to-one work anymore but we upload like educational content so we've got like fair eight thousand members on a coaching platform who will come on and we deliver like education and then give them the support and the community there to be able to make their own choice on what is going to fit for them Yeah. Let me say something about that. I think that's very valuable. And there was certainly a point in my life where I was not motivated at all to exercise. So to, to pay somebody to just show up and exercise was super valuable or to have somebody say, here's the way you do a bunch of exercises is super valuable. Um, and, and I understand that. So I, I don't want to totally knock the, the trainers I went to because yeah, yeah. There, wa- there was a time in my life where I just wasn't, I wasn't going to do anything unless I turned up at the gym and they told me what to do. So I think, I think some exercise every day is better than nothing. And, and I would vacillate for a long time between I'm going to do nothing 
or I'm going to do exactly what you say. And then I went over to the other side where it's like, I'm going to go to failure every day. And, and yeah. none of those are ideal for me today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's pretty much the accountability factor of having that, that support there. I suppose then even what's interesting is, would you mind running kind of through what your training looks like at, at the moment and compared to how it's changed over the, the years? I can only imagine how much more, um, more progressive it is now and how you're measuring metrics and how the the program then scales now that you work with mike after following his work for a long time but i've been intrigued to kind of like hear what you're doing like a week-to-week -week basis at the moment that's okay yeah sure um i basically do um push legs pull and and then throw in arms kind of randomly obviously triceps are on push days and and but i do i you know there was a there was a, a, a picture I took and I was like my biceps are tiny and Jared's like well you can do a lot more biceps let's throw random biceps in a lot and yeah. and that was something I thought I can only do biceps on on my pull day and he was like no you can do you can do biceps much more than that and so I probably do biceps four days a week maybe even five um, but like Monday is almost always a chest day Tuesday is legs. Wednesday is back. Uh, Thursday, tomorrow is chest again. And then it depends on my week. If I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm only able to work out five days a week, like sometimes, cause I have kids in college yeah. and sometimes they're home and when they're here on the weekends, then Friday will be a mixture of back and legs. Otherwise I'll do Friday legs and Saturday back if I'm no kids are in town. Um, and, uh, and the, the 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 increase in volume is uh, very little weight, but it is going deeper into reps and reserves. So like week one, I'll try to keep three reps and reserve with everything and and no more than probably three sets of any specific exercise. And then by the time we get to like week five or week six, I'm going as close to failure as possible. Again, I'm alone in the gym. So failure on the bench press is not going to be something I'm interested in because again I'm alone in the gym I don't want to be the guy stuck with the the bar on my chest you know what I mean so very very close to failure um I will do bicep curls to failure in that week uh I will do stuff on machines to failure in that week but only in that week um you know I'm how happily do leg press to failure, but I'll never do heavy squats to failure ever because I, I don't really need to do that. Um, that's basically the evolution. And then I deload and I'm kind of like, not the most enthusiastic for the week, but I, but I understand it. And I'm like excited about next week. Yeah. I think that's cool. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's just so interesting because obviously you've educated yourself massively, it sounds like, over the years in comparison to what you were doing. Now I've been like, okay, I know what progressive overload is. I actually know how to build lean muscle tissue. I know exactly what I'm doing. And it is obviously something we're really big on is, yeah, you can give someone a diet and how to work out, but if they're not actually educated on how much protein to have, what progressive overload is that's where the sustainability comes from as well, being able to maintain something by just actually knowing what yeah, to do. 100%. I think, that, I think that's the thing with training and, and we had, um, I don't know if you've seen, you probably have done with Mike, we had Brad Schoenfeld on like a couple of months ago. He's a really cool guy. He's so clever. Yeah. <laughs> like some, some yeah. shit, just like. He kept saying stuff and I was like, oh yeah, what does that, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I talk to Mike a lot, Mike Isretel a lot too and, and I'll just kind of be like, I'm sure those sciencey words are yeah. awesome. Yeah. I don't know what they mean. Yeah. As long as you, you get know. a good bicep pump and a good chest pump on chest, yeah. day, that's, that's, that's good it. Enough. That's all I care about. <laughs> yeah. I think that for, for a long time, I had like ambiguous ideas of what I wanted from my body, from my training, from my diet for, for, for a long time, it was just, I want to lose weight. Right. And then, I, I found it really is not hard to lose weight. I can lose weight. I, I suffered. I was in such a state of, of uh, physical discomfort and mental discomfort for so long, eating however I wanted, that the idea of a short-term physical and mental discomfort by dieting is not such a big deal to me. Um, I can 
kind of do anything for a couple of months. Um, but then it, then it became like, how, is it possible to have something long term? I never, I always thought lifestyle change, it, it made my skin crawl, but mostly because I didn't really understand it. I thought a diet is lifestyle change because this is not what I was doing before. This is different. But I, I you know, it took me a while to realize that if you, if you actually diet forever, you die because that's what happens. That's famine. You know, that's the end result of implementing a diet forever. Um, it becomes anorexia and you, and you die. Yeah. Um, but this idea of changing the way I eat forever was also unrealistic because I had so many habits built in. I, the, if, if you had told me, um, you know, five or six years ago, you just you compose a meal of things that you think are healthy and then eat until you're full. I can't do that. I don't know what that means. I, I blew over that signal so many times as a kid that it just didn't exist within me anymore. So it was actually having to like take months and months of, of doing that to realize like, oh, if I, if I'm actually paying attention, I can kind of sense my body going, you've had enough food and yeah. guess what? It's, it's an appropriate meal. And like all of that just takes work and effort. And it, it takes the ability to, um, uh, to, to actually confront the fact that it takes a long time and that, that it is a lot of work, but it's surprisingly easier mm -hmm. than the other way. Yeah, so from like a hormonal hormonal perspective, like when you're going through that, like your leptin and ghrelin levels and everything must have been fucked in regards to like hunger signals and appetite. And when you're feeling full, you're just blown past that point completely where you could just go and go and go and go. Especially if you're like one of those people who's like, it's all or nothing kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's that's quite fair for a lot of health and fitness enthusiasts. That a lot of the time they're all or nothing. And sometimes it can be a good thing when it comes to sticking to stuff, but it's all it can be bad like we know when it comes to eating disorders and can really skew people's relationships with food because they'll go too far the, the other way do you think you ever got to a point any point along the journey where you ran into those kind of issues where your relationship was really skewed with food yeah i mean well for many many years and this also began in my childhood because after after kind of like my grandparents and parents tried to just stop me from eating by saying like, you're done and that's it. Right. And, and they weren't like messing with the food itself. Um, when that didn't work, we, we kind of graduated. We also live in Hollywood where these kind of trendy, like, you know, aha, if you just don't eat cucumber skin, you're going to be okay. Like that's a real thing out here, you know? Um, and, and, and like, uh, I mean, no, that's true. Like, what? you know, if you, if you, you have to peel peppers and don't eat the seeds. And if you want to be healthy, you have to like take the seeds out of cucumber and skin them. Like there, there are really wacky diets out here. So there was a, a lot of years where it was looking for the foods that were causing me to be overweight and even then, or, you know, what foods are appropriate for my blood type or, you know, having muscle testing muscle. This is this total scam where doctors like touch you here and lift your arm and, and tell you like, oh, you're allergic to, you know, beets or something like this complete crazy yeah, nonsense. Mental. Yeah. And, um, and I became accustomed to this idea of like, it isn't, it's also much easier for somebody to give you a solution of like, you're just allergic to carbohydrates or gluten mm -hmm. or whatever it is. It's GMOs that are causing you to be obese or, you know, refined sugar or what it, it, it wasn't ever like, Hey dude, you're, you're eating too much. Like work on composing appropriate meals and change your habits. It was like, you know, there's there's a place down the street from my house where I, I was off gluten so I'm not allowed to eat gluten fair fine but like they make a pizza that's gluten-free it's got to have more calories than a regular <laughs> pizza 
you know, and so I'm eating this going like I can eat this every day because it has no gluten and I'm gaining weight. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing wrong? You know, yeah. um, so it was really kind of turning that that changing my perspective from like, there's nothing wrong with any of this food. Now, uh, I quote unquote, I say I eat clean. I think that's a ridiculous term, too, although I do, you know, most of my meals are very lean protein rice and vegetables that's what i eat a lot yeah. but sometimes i go and have ice cream mm. and uh, i will say i don't always feel great after i eat ice cream and that's kind of my signal like okay i know i shouldn't be eating this every day because i don't feel good you know that's kind of it that's my gauge i'm not allergic to it um you know that's it yeah i think we should we should a lot of the time eat on how we feel as well i think that's just a, a perfectly good, good metric i think the thing that you touched on there in regards to like these weird and wonderful things like at the end of the day that's the shit that sells and that's why it still does well like it, it's like if you took a dog for example it's pretty boring to put it into this perspective but if you took your dog to the vet and it was overweight the thing you'd probably say to you is well walk a little bit more and reduce its fucking portion sizes but people just don't want to hear that like it's not it, it doesn't give them like the buzz of, of trying something like which is hardcore and it it's too easy for a lot of people to fathom the thing that especially over in the uk i don't know how much in the us i think that we've picked up on and this is a slightly i, I don't think you call it a fad but it seems to be more of a trend um is like the anti-diet culture and the body positivity movement and there's like there's some positives coming out of it but i think there's a lot of negative mm -hmm. stuff to come from like in the uk there's actually a doctor called the fat doctor and she's like been actively promoting like disempowering people from trying to lose weight and like basically saying if you failed you shouldn't do it you should just give up it's all it's too much on genetic basis on inheritance where you've been born into your privilege and it's like fucking crazy the shit that she's she's coming out with and it, it's it's pushing like this movement even more of like body positivity and I, I, at the end of the day like i believe that you should like love your body you should be positive but at the end of the day a beautiful body doesn't mean it's a healthy body and i think that's the message that we still need to get across is that we shouldn't be disempowering people to to stop trying we should be supporting people so i'd be interested to, to know kind of like your opinion on that ethan as well like that sort of movement. and do you see that like a lot in the in the u.s as well oh my god yeah it's yeah. it's 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 wild um i have a slightly nuanced idea on it because at the end of the day i I don't think anybody should be doing anything that they don't want to be doing. Mm -hmm. I think that for me is a, a point of, of almost guaranteed failure. Mm -hmm. If you're being forced to do something that you don't want to be doing, I, I don't see this as working. But if we, if we take like your, your fat doctor's metrics and we go to the poorest country on earth who, who people are being, uh, born into what we could consider the worst poverty and the, the worst conditions. There is zero obesity in those countries. Um, so I, I look around and I just see um, just opulence and wealth and no need for a lot of people. You know, dude, there are professional video game players now who can make a fortune just playing video games like what the hell does that guy need to have a six-pack for or, or need to be able to like lift crates he doesn't so if that dude doesn't care um about the metrics of health i make a conscious trade-offs every day i drive a car this is not inherently safe this adds risk to my life um i don't smoke but i only don't smoke because i have children if I didn't have children, I would be smoking for sure. My wife was pregnant with uh, one of our daughters. You know, if you go all the way back to when my first kids were babies, we were still smoking because, you know, nobody was that critical of it back then. We knew it wasn't good for you. Um, my wife gets pregnant with our third kid and, and she suddenly just couldn't stand the smell of it and said like, you're done smoking because yeah. I don't like how it smells. And I go like, okay, but then you're going to let me smoke when the kid is born. Right. And she said, no, you are done smoking. So I was done smoking. I don't look at people who smoke and think, 
God, they're such bad people because they're unhealthy. I don't care. I'm actually a little bit envious of them. So from that sense, um, for me, I don't care what choices people make, but I think that a lot of these people who, who have goals and are, are going down really, really difficult paths to attain their goals and then are experiencing failures. And rather than being given the information of like, I, I know or I suspect I have a structure that will be successful for you. They're being told it's okay. Your goal is wrong. Your goal is yeah. bad. This this idea is wrong. I think that's borderline evil. Um, but at the same time, I don't really like the idea that everybody should have the same idea of health as this prime goal. For me, I love Lizzo. I think Lizzo is a badass. Do you know her? Yeah, Do you yeah, have yeah. her over cool. there? Yeah. Like, I want to high five Lizzo and like hang out with her and tell her she's a badass chick. And like, I really think that way. I think anybody who feels super positive about their body, um, regardless of what like the societal norms are, I say more power to them. Um, at the same time, Lizzo does a cleanse because she wants to, That's she lot, wants yeah. health and she takes a bunch of shit for yeah. it. And I'm like, this is insane. This to me is insane. Anybody who's telling you that your goal is wrong, I think should be, you know, told to shut up. Yeah. Um, uh, but also anybody who's telling you that you must have this goal, I think should be told to shut up. So I, 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 I don't like this idea that we, can pretend that being overweight is healthy because we know scientifically that it, 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 it is a metric in um, declining health, earlier uh, mortality rate, like all of these things. We know that. We know that smoking is not healthy. But if you want to smoke, by all means smoke. If you want to ride a dirt bike and, it's, and you know like your, your, your risk for in doing this is higher, uh, go ahead. Let's not pretend either way though, you know? Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. I think that, that kind of thing came in as well with the whole, there was that quote, it wasn't like, you can be fat but fit. But this right. was like completely different because this was talking about like being metabolic, metabolic fit. Like we know that fat tissue and adiposity still means that you'll be at more risk from heart disease, more risk of cardiovascular disease, more risk of type 2 diabetes. So I think that one was squashed fairly early, but it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I want to say something to that. I think that the idea, look, I know when I was very, very overweight, I was embarrassed about being out in public or going and doing something like taking a walk up in a mountain with my wife. And, and, and so I think the idea that you can tell people like, you don't necessarily have to, by the way, you got to think about it in terms of like the, the, the avalanche of information out there is telling you in order to lose weight, you got to do all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Right. And so that's overwhelming. And so to be a fat person who's looking at it and going like, God, that just seems so exhausting and so hard. And there's so many failures. I don't want to do that. And then to have somebody come along and go, it's okay. But, you know, you can be fit and overweight, too. You don't have to make all these tractors. Go for a walk. Go outside. It's okay. People, let's cut these guys a break. No fat shaming. I'm all for that because the truth is your health markers are going to improve if you live a, a more active lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, like, and then we have, yes, it all becomes super convoluted. At, at some point, um, you know, we live in a day and age and in, in both of our countries are so wealthy that there is so much less absolute demand for survival by using our bodies. You know, um, the guy who's out there doing construction and super active every day has more demand on his body than the majority of people in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I can understand his needs being different. Um, I, I just, I, it, 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 it kind of crushes my heart when when people are are arguing that 
we should all be fat and that they're and that you know we're not looking at like it's not poverty in a, in america that makes people fat it's wealth yeah this yeah. is the opposite yeah. of what they're saying yeah i think i think it's so right what you just touched on there because i know the thing that we spoke to people a lot about is that like weight stigma and stigmatization of that has absolutely no place whatsoever in in the fitness industry because we know like from studies that have been done it, it crushes people's confidence self-confidence motivation it doesn't do anything to help people who at the end no. of the day they're there to try and they're trying to better themselves so that person who's there to put their arm around someone said it's going to be okay we can focus on this do this they're going to help there's a lot of people especially in it and that's why I think social media can be quite toxic is they they just like to comment on people's status and what they're doing and it's not because they give a shit about that person they want to help the obesity rate it, it's just from like a different narrative and it's that kind of waste stigmatization which at the end of the day is is putting so many people off from joining gyms or starting something or speaking to an individual who might be able to help them because they feel like judged all the time and I think that's so hard for so many individuals. I'm sure it, it was probably a case for you, Ethan, at some point in, in regard to the feeling judged, as you said, like even going out in public sometimes. Yeah, I, it took me a while before I had the confidence to even walk into a gym. And, um, and then I was still embarrassed. Like I didn't know what I was doing and I had a trainer to tell me what to do. But you, you look around and there are, there tend to be more kind of fit people in gym in gyms than, than out of shape people. It can be a lot. Uh, now today, if I see anybody who looks new at the gym, I make sure to smile at them. I make sure that they feel welcome. I think that's an important thing to do um, because ultimately, you know, we were all there at some point. Nobody w walked into a gym or started working out with the body of an yeah. Adonis. It took work. It took effort, you know? So, so I, I just think that, um, I think both sides uh, need to be a little bit more or a little bit less authoritative. Like this fat doctor, you know, telling people that their goals of, of health or weight loss or vanity or whatever it is, whatever an individual's goals are, are wrong or trying to create some, you know, complex mental maze that you have to do gymnastics through to understand, um, and to why they feel that they want to make a change. Look, dude, my back hurts, uh, hurt. My, my knees hurt. Uh, I was physically uncomfortable. That's not enough of a goal that I just want to change that. I, I no, no, I, I wanted to change because of patriarchy and, and, you know, racist society telling me that I had to, this is nonsense mm -hmm. to me. And this is the thing as well. I feel like, and this is the quote that you always use actually, that prisons don't work and punishment doesn't work. Like the reoffending rate in the UK is ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. If you've if you've come out of prison, and it's the same with fitness. Like by punishing people and saying don't do this, don't do that, fat shaming, it is not going to work. They they don't need to hear that. They need positive reinforcement. They need to know yeah. you're doing so well. Keep going. They don't need your fat fuck off. Like mm -hmm. you wouldn't ever say that to someone. So it is, and I've definitely seen on social media that. that the stuff that comes out of people's mouths on social media can be so toxic. Whether you are trying to gain weight, maybe like I've had it when I was I had my eating disorder, awful comments. Um, whether it's people who are losing weight, punishment doesn't work, and it, it won't ever work in that sense. Well, as as human beings of our own psychology, the way that like we're motivated to do stuff is not to avoid punishment or avoid the negative it's because we want like that reward we want positive reinforcement mm. for something so that's why like with stuff for cigarettes for years we've been putting on the back of smoking will kill you no one gives a fuck people are still smoking all the time it's like they're not bothered about avoiding that they want the reward from it mm. and it's got to be the same with health and fitness by stigmatizing it and telling people you're a piece of shit it doesn't help anyone if anything it has the complete opposite, opposite effect, effect. And it, yeah. it's funny that that thing, same thing with smoking because it's, I, I compared it to some with someone the other day in regards to the stigma with obesity and, and weight. And there's a lot of, even from like a medical side of GPs and stuff as well, which has been published recently. And it's so different to when you look at those with health implications from smoking. Like if you looked at someone who had cancer because of smoking, I feel like the stigma is way different when you look at someone with who's overweight and has got medical conditions because of that. And the, the whole 
term of obesity has just such a negative association people like to point the finger in different ways at someone who's maybe obese and someone who's got cancer from smoking if that makes sense yeah yeah i mean there's there's many people who wear their um their state of unhealthiness beneath the skin that we can't see yeah too you know we yeah. could there's so many metrics for this there's you know you could have a, a rather thin alcoholic who has fatty liver disease and sclerosis, sclerosis of the liver. And we don't, we don't see that. Yeah. That's nothing we can see. You could have a guy who's, you know, got super high cholesterol and is borderline, you know, to have a heart attack every day. We don't see that, but we see obesity. It's so objectively right there mm-hmm. that I think it's a, it's an easy thing to kind of like point at and, and, you know, for sure, I think we should, as a society, do better, but we shouldn't pretend that it's healthy. Yeah. That, the two things Agreed. I don't think are mutually exclusive. Yeah. So we shouldn't be glorifying it, basically. I suppose if, yeah. if, with that, Ethan, as well, you don't mind me asking, do you, there's, with weight loss, there's obviously a lot of reversibility in regards to certain conditions and symptoms. Have you had any long impact and effects from that um, stage where you were maybe at your heaviest weight and coming down? Uh, not, not as far as like cardiovascular or, or, or metabolic. I'm very, very healthy in those right. terms. I still have like some foot and ankle pain that I'm sure is just because I was carrying so much mm-hmm. weight for so long, but, um, but, but n- no, my blood is very, very clean. I've had many, you know, deep, uh, stress tests and re- nuclear stress tests and, and EKGs and all of this, I've, I've got a very good, clean bill of health. Yeah, cool. That's great to hear. I think yeah. that's no surprise at the end of the day. Like, if every time you stand up, you're basically squatting like 500 pounds of walking, like, imagine walking mm. with that much weight on a fucking bar. Like, Five, 500 pound squat is, what's that in kg? That's like 260 yeah, it's about, kg. It's about 220, 220. Ooh, 220 kg still. <laughs> it's a big, it's a big, big number. There's, there's no surprise you can have an impact on the joints and stuff eventually. I suppose though, for you and your fitness um, journey, then Ethan, what is the next step for you? And like, what does the future look like for you in regards to your personal fitness journey? Um, I just want to get, you know, I want to edge towards uh, th- th- this kind of weight that is like as lean as I, as, as, as kind of lean as I can get that I still feel um, comfortable was around 255 um and even that i look at the pictures and i'm like i'm a little small i look a little small so i'd like to um work to get to 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 be that weight but leaner so you know this is a long process if i put on four or five pounds of muscle this year i'll be very happy so if i can get to 255 and even um, I think the, the, the last time I was 9% body fat. So if I, in a DEXA scan, if I can get to 255 and be 8% body fat or 7% body fat, um, that'd be pretty cool. You know, sub 10% body fat is not something that I'm going to hang out at very yeah. long. That's like a, a short window that I have to exist there, but I think it's this cool target. And I'll continue to do it in the way we've been discussing where I, where I take my really long maintenance periods and that's where I'm trying to build muscle or I do a little bit of massing, but I have the uh, propensity to hold a lot of water. So increasing my carbohydrates, even a little bit, I can, I can rapidly accumulate um, water. I know it's not fat, um, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a very good thing. If I do this for a few years and then I'm just on maintenance for the rest of my life, I'll be very happy. I think it, it's, um, it's just so like refreshing to hear from someone yourself in the, in the position of authority and the experience that you've been through to it be in such like a sustainable way and put across like that. Like we hear so many other people and especially celebrities are pushing stuff in different ways. I think it's just so refreshing to hear that from your point of view. 
um, that you're doing it in that way. And at the end of the day, we all have different goals. Sometimes we want to like slim down and get as, as lean as possible. And then sometimes you just want to get to a point where your neck's eating your fucking head because you just, you just, you just want to get big and saucy. But <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> but um, I suppose just finishing off with that then, Ethan, where, what is like the future plans with you and your career moving forward as well then? Do you still see very much in acting? Because I feel like... If with, with the direction you're moving at the moment, I feel like you have a very big part to play in in, in, in fitness, fitness and health and in, in general as well. And the message you you were pushing is like so powerful. Yeah, I, I you know I'm really enjoying what I'm doing now. The, the last uh, year has been very weird. There was obviously a huge portion of time where there was no acting work. Everything was done, and we're starting to come out of it. I was able to do a movie. That was very cool, although it was super weird with the amount of COVID testing we had to undergo. And like, it was just a, a, new, a whole new way of, of doing anything. Um, you know, not having human contact in a scene because there's this thing called COVID and we're taking our masks off right before we shoot. It was weird. Yeah. Um, but I think we're, they're figuring out how to, uh, how to do all this uh, safely, I guess. And also, I think we're coming to the point where so many people have had COVID and there's a vaccine and like, you know, maybe we hit herd immunity soon and then we can all just go party and go to yeah, Coachella literally. again or something like that, right? Um, that's what I'm rooting for. Uh, and yeah, I, I still expect to, to, to work as an actor, uh, but I am having a lot of fun you know, talking to people like you and talking to Dr. Mike and working with Jared and, and, and um, trying to, you know, I like to have people on my podcast, American Glutton, who I have all manner of people. Um, the majority are people who are going to reinforce what we're talking about here. But I also will have guys on who are like, no, Nobody should be eating. I, you know, I've had vegans on. I've had carnivores on. That's the other thing that's so wild to me. When I was a little kid, there were vegetarians. Um, and then there were people who who ate more. You know, we had the Atkins diet when I was yeah. a little kid. Yeah. But there was no vegans and carnivore. We have these factions now where it seems wild to me. And I'll talk to them because if one guy hears that and goes like, I that actually sounds like something I could do, then I'm happy. I'm happy for people to have success doing whatever. I, I, I do find the way I do it to be the best, but it doesn't mean it's the only way. You know, I've tried lots of stuff. This happens to be the one that I've had years of, of success and maintenance and, and, and not had to put on 50 pounds because I forgot to diet one day, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. I think um on that as well. I think you started listening to some of Evan's podcast as well, haven't you? Yes, I have. And just for everyone listening, in case they didn't catch it, where can people find you best? Either it is on Instagram or your podcast. Plug yourself away. Yeah. Where can people yeah. get all the um, info? Instagram at Ethan Suplee, and the podcast is called American Glutton. Amazing. Is that on um? iTunes and Spotify or do you, have you got a YouTube channel for that as well? We have a YouTube channel but I, I'm I don't know how to do YouTube Th listen I barely know how to do any of this shit so I, <laughs> I just like they, I go to a studio and I talk and then they do something yeah. but I, we do have a YouTube but I don't know I don't know if there's anything on it but I know yes Spotify and iTunes cool yeah well you, you can find more of you from there and I think there'll be a lot more uh, in regards to your message and more people will be able to dig into. And I'm sure we'll have some some awesome guests on on there and stuff as well that all, all listeners can definitely tune into and, and take a lot more away from, from your message and see how your journey is going to evolve over the next few months and next year or so as well. So definitely recommend people pop over to there. Yeah, honestly, your journey is very unique, but I also think it will help so many freaking people like a lot of our listeners like we are completely worldwide but obviously very uk based and we do work with a lot of people who are overweight or are obese and they are struggling so hearing your story and how you've overcome it in a really really positive way not even just your journey though but like the fact where you are now i think it's so important like you have balance you have sustainability you have enjoyment it will be so nice for everyone to kind of 
I guess, see a light as well at the end of yeah. the tunnel. Do you know what I mean? Like, see a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not all, it's not all bad. You won't always feel like this. So yeah, we massively, massively appreciate having you on. It's, it's really, really been eye-opening and incredible. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it too. Thank you very much. So if anyone who is um, tuning into this week's episode, please tag me and Lucy on Instagram, tag Ethan as well, um, because we'll see your tags and stuff as well. It'd be great just to see you sharing the podcast and pushing the episode out as always. And please make sure that you leave a five-star review on iTunes because it's much appreciated. Yeah, because we want to be number one. Yeah, in the in the UK finish charts, bottle. we don't want to, we don't fancy number two nah. anymore. We want to be a uh, you either winning or fucking losing. Yeah, literally, we spoke about that today, haven't we? So, <laughs> thank you so much again, Ethan, and thank you to everyone who has listened and Bye, tuned guys. in.